This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Roja Shy. Roja Shy here with another episode in our series of episodes about the Bitcoin block size debate. On this episode, we're going to cover uh, Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin XT. These are proposed solutions to the block size debate that came out of the bit from Bitcoin Core developers, actually, um, that have been, you say, not exactly well received, but, well, initially they were, but as time has moved on, uh, it hasn't been implemented. They were created by both Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen. Um, there were other creators that will get into that. But this episode is episode uh, 131, titled Red Flag on the Play, Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin XT. But before we get into the episode, the news. This comes from Bitcoin.com. Arbor now offers deposits and drills at 60 plus U.S. financial institutions like Kevin Hill. The Bitcoin payment startup Arbor has been busy adding to the services offering since Bitcoin.com report out its progress in January. Arbor users in the U.S. and the Philippines can buy Bitcoin via their bank account or with cash. The list of supported banks has been going fast, and on Thursday, the company announced that over 60 U.S. banks and credit unions are now supported for both deposit and withdrawal. Users load money into the company's smartphone app in two ways, with a bank account or with cash. The company started offering the option to buy Bitcoin via bank accounts in early March. But only users in the U.S. and the Philippines, there is no fees added to send or withdraw money from the bank account. Initially, only 17 U.S. banks were supported. However, on Thursday, the company announced the addition of many, US, many more U.S. financial institutions, stating that, our latest update supported the for 46 new U.S. banks and credit unions bring the total number of supported U.S. banks and credit unions to 63. In the U.S., these banks are supported by adding withdrawing funds held in the Arbor app. The company's website states at press time that there are 34 banks and 29 credit unions supported. They include Bank of America, Capital One, Charles Schwab, Chase, Citibank, Commerce Bank, Fidelity, SunTrust, TD Bank, USAAA, Union Bank, and Wells Fargo. In the Philippines, adding funds to an Arbor account can be done through only three banks, uh, BDO, Union Bank, BPI, and Union Bank. Withdrawals can be done via most major banks, according to the Arbor websites, including Bank of Commerce, Citibank, HSBC, Metro Bank, and Union Bank. A full list of supported financial institutions for both the U.S. and the Philippines can be found in here. What makes Arbor unique, however, is its network of human tellers, which currently supports over 50 currencies globally. While users outside the U.S. and the Philippines will have to use Bitcoin to add or withdraw money from the Arbor wallet, a teller can give them their local currency. The company is currently working to build out its teller network so that users can cash in and out from anywhere around the globe. At the end of March, the company revealed that there are Arbor tellers in over 100 different cities worldwide, including over 15 hundred locations in the Philippines. And then the article kind of goes on. I think this is great. Um, it allows for more individuals to be able to get um, Bitcoin. Yes, they're using a financial institution. AM, AML and KYC is available. But again, this allows for people to be able to get their hands on some Bitcoin. This comes from Coindollar.com by Nina Long. Hacked or corrupted? Suspicion of insider trading at Poland X. There's been some issues lately with Polonix as a whole, um, but we'll continue on. On April 18, 2017, Polonix published an announcement that it was going to be the 17 altcoins. However, there are signs that someone knew about Polonix's decision to remove some altcoins before the official announcement on Twitter. CoinDoll received information of possible insider trading at Polonix from a representative of Bolu. Boex Ellis? B-O-X-E-L-U-S. Cryptocurrency experts projected a delisting from a major cryptocurrency exchange such as Polonix would have ne- negative effect on each of the altcoins. Listing and then delisting altcoins will also manipulate markets, but it seems that someone has already earned some money using this situation. Price charts of the altcoins that were named to be delisted for Boeing X Exchange are Blueberry, BitStar, Coin 2.1, CureCoin, Horizon, IO, I-O Coin, Mirid, NobleCoin, New Shares, QuickBick, Core, Quitlo, Rubicon, and Shadow Cash. Well, Shadow Cash, from my understanding, was kept a good place in April, was switching into a different token so that makes sense but i've never heard anything of these other coins uh supernet bullocks and mad guy shows there were a massive sell-offs of these coins just before the announcement from pony x and they have a list of all the different charts showing it uh martin ripto of ceo of bullocks and bullocks coins suspects the insider trading around pony x he commented to coindoll.com honestly they sent no warning whatsoever there was no problems with the bullocks or no bullocks in fact we are better than ever I don't know why they chose to delist us. They haven't contacted us previously, but if you care to investigate, take a look at the graphics of, of all the coins announced to be delisted. They all follow the trend that if someone knew they were going to be delisted, hence price dropping like crazy, they all look alike. He continued, We don't have proof, but everyone is saying through the grapevine that there was inside knowledge. This could turn into a shitstorm. We want to know why we got delisted and address any issues to be listed again. 
Also, we want to know about the pattern of all these coins followed exactly one day after the announcement. Suspected insider trading. Insider trading is traditionally financial markets to prohibit and some countries face penalties as high as three times the amount of profit gained or loss avoided from illegal trading. The United States or even imprisonment uh, in India. In the EU and UK, all trading of non-public information is subject at a minimum to civil penalties and to possible criminal penalties as well. However, to date, there's no regulation of such actions in cryptocurrency and blockchain market. A cryptocurrency trading expert who wishes to stay anonymous spoke to CoinDoll.com of the situation at CoinX. There are people already organized to present a class action lawsuit for insider trading. I don't know if, it's going to, if that's going to go anywhere. That's a bad storm for exchange, having your emails turned over, and investigations out, inside out, a lot of explaining to do. So there's that. And then I have an article I'm not going to read, but it's a, I'm going to do a complete separate uh, thing about ICOs and tokens that have been all the rage. Uh, a lot of it this year, but the last two years uh, within the cryptocurrency space. And it's about the Mycelium, the Mycelium wallet uh, to uh, token that was uh, launched last year. And finally, um, an update on Ross Ulbricht's appeal. This comes from LinkNation.com. The Silk Road founder Ross Ulbricht will spend life in prison after losing appeal. Uh, this article is by Kaiser Sorce. Our reasonable people may be, uh, this is an embedded uh, tweet from Andy Greenberg. Reasonable people may and do disagree about the social utility of harsh sentences for the disruption of controlled substances or even the criminal pro prohibition of the sale and use of the appellate court's opinion reads. It's very possible that at some future point we will come to regard the, these politics as a tragic mistake and adopt less punitive and more effective measures of reducing the incidence and cost of drug use. At this point in our history, however, the, dem the democratically elected representatives of the people have opted for a policy of prohibit prohibit prohibitation. Backed by severe punishment, they said the judge writes. Andy Greenberg, even the judge who condemned Silk, Silk Road creator Ross Ulbricht to, life in prison, to a life sentence doesn't seem to agree with the U.S. drug laws. Uh, Silk Road website founder loses appeal convention for life sentence. This is another bit of part from Reuters. Ross Ulbricht, the accused mastermind behind the underground Silk Road website for the sale of illegal drugs to customers worldwide, failed to persuade a federal appeals court to overturn his convention and life sentence. The second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Manhattan on Wednesday rejected Albrecht claimed that he was denied a fair trial because he could not introduce evidence of corruption by two federal agents involved in his corrupt. It also rejected the 30-year-old Albrecht claim that his present term of life with no possibility for parole was too long. The three-judge panel cited a staggering $183 million of illegal drugs sold on Silk Road from 2011 to 2013, and the lower court's findings more likely than not that Albrecht arranged at least five murders to hire to protect Silk Road's anonymity. That he was able to distance himself from the actual violence he paid by using a computer to order the killings is not Mitigated Circuit, Circuit Judge Gerard Lynch wrote in a 139 page decision. It's indeed, the cruelty that he displayed is a casual and confident negotiation for the hits is unnerving. There is no evidence that any of the murders took place, Lynch said. Uh, Josh Durald, a lawyer for Ulbricht, declined to comment, including on whether the U.S. Supreme Court appeal was possible. A spokeswoman for the acting U.S. Attorney, uh, Jun Kim, in Manhattan, declined to comment. Jurors in February 2015, case going over. Uh, kind of skip it down here. Uh, Doral had argued that Albrecht should have been allowed to introduce evidence of corruption during the probe by former Secret Service agent Sean Bridges and Drug Enforcement Administrator agent Carl Forbes. Both later plead, plead guilty to money laundering and other charges who were sentenced to prison after stealing book coins during the probe. Uh, Lynch, however, said that while the shocking personal contributions of these two government agents, uh, this is his mother, disgraced the agency in which they worked, it has nothing to do with whether Albrecht operated the site as Dread, dread Pirate Roberts. Okay, that, I guess that's the same judge. The case in U.S. v. Ulbricht, Second U.S. Court Appeals, uh, number is 15 1815. So there is a push to have this appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm not sure if it's going to go anywhere, if it's going to be affirmed, or they're going to pick up the case, but uh, he lost the appeal. And we're going to, like I stated earlier about the, Bolivi the Bolivians, uh, we're going to talk about some of these series of court cases that have been happening. And just the nature of the individuals uh, involved and responsible for, you know, the community as a whole and addressing a lot of these criminal cases that are happening within the cryptocurrency space. Well, that's it for the news. And uh, now onto the discussion at hand about Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin XT. So we're going to talk about Bitcoin Classic first. I'm going to start with talking about who supports Bitcoin Classic. Now, some of these names might sound familiar to you. They are Coinbase, Binstat, Bitsam, Circle are some businesses that support it. Circle and Coinbase, are, or at least Circle at one point, was a means upon which you can purchase Bitcoin from them. They are actually f was a fairly 
easy use case. All you had to do was input your credit card or debit card. Um, you know, you had to do AML, KYC, and just purchase and buy. It was very simple. Coinbase operates the same way. It has a wallet. It has an exchange. It also does uh, merchant payment services. Roger Ver, Jeff Garzik, and Gavin Andreessen are individuals that are prominent within the community. Roger Ver, known as a Bitcoin Jesus, and he also controls a couple uh, different uh, Bitcoin mining and companies. Uh, we'll get into them when we talk about Bitcoin Unlimited. Gavin Andreessen, the man that was handed the uh, the reins of Bitcoin by Satoshi Nakamoto himself. He also was the one who thought perhaps Craig Wright might be uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. <clears throat> you know, he's a good-natured person, but uh, he might be not a bit naive, I guess, or might not have the best uh, human judgment, if you will. And then Jeff Garzik, who was also a Bitcoin core developer, both Gavin, uh, Gavin and Jeff have contributed to Bitcoin. Um, we have spoken about them. We're talking about the other guys that um, have maintained the Bitcoin protocol. Um, both uh, have not uh, contributed to the uh, Bitcoin uh, project um, in a while. Uh, Gavin Anderson has actually has left. Um, Jeff Garzik also has his own particular um, company. It's called Block BLQ. Currently, as it stands, there's only 148 Bitcoin Classic nodes operating. As far as mining goes, um, we talked about it a little bit in the last episode. It it doesn't really even hit the charts, really, as far as who's mining the Bitcoin Classic. Um, it's significantly dropped, if you will. So let's get into Bitcoin Classic. What is it? So this comes from the Wicca. Bitcoin Classic is one of the several forks of the Bitcoin reference implementation of the Bitcoin Core. It aims to increase the transaction process capacity of Bitcoin by increasing the block size, blocks which are formed and aggregated transaction data from the basic structure of the blockchain. Bitcoin Classic started as similar to those less aggressive than the Bitcoin XT fork, which never managed to get the support it needed. Uh, Bitcoin Classic in the first eight months promoted a single increase in the Bitcoin block size from one megabyte to two megabytes. So it just wants to fork everything up to two megabytes. There's no add-ons like a SegWit or Lightning Network or anything like that. It's just let's increase the block size. Uh, in November 2016, the change in the project moved to solutions to move to limit out the software rules into the hands of the miners in the node. Uh, Bitcoin Classic is also an attempt to move the technical governance of a decentralized and independent real Bitcoin project from the developers of the Bitcoin Core to a voting process involving a large community of miners, businesses, developers, and users. There's no formal activation method of the software, but due to the nature of the Bitcoin supermajority, it needs to support it. And I just stated who supports it. So, so this article comes from Bitcoin Magazine. So, in- so who created Bitcoin Classic? That would be, as we discussed um, last episode, as there was a split within the uh, Bitcoin Core developers as they were trying to figure out what to do next. You have, this comes from the article Brave New Coin. The developers are Gavin Andreessen and Jeff Garzik and Bitcoin expert Jonathan Toon. And is an example of a hard fork. So Bitcoin Classic operates on an activation threshold of 75%. If three quarters of the Bitcoin network's hash power switches to Bitcoin Classic, it would effectively implement the new Classic protocol in replacing the core chain and increase the block size to 2 megabytes instantaneously. So this is what the Bitcoin Classic proposal states is going to be. It's just going to raise the block size from 1 megabyte to 2 megabyte. Now they do have a roadmap, and I'm going to read the roadmap. And it kind of breaks down a little bit further about what this proposal is. And it operates with the BIP-109. And we'll read the BIP-109. Not the entirety of it, but just basically the abstract or the summary, if you will. The Bitcoin Classic team unveils the 2016 roadmap by Alan Scott. So this is from Bitcoin.com. So the three phases of the Bitcoin Classic roadmap roadmap aims to help realize the Satoshi's version of making Bitcoin scale into a global peer-to-peer cash system by implementing BIP-109 to raise the block size limit from 1 megabyte to 2 megabytes. However, the proposal will, first, will be first sent to miners, Bitcoin companies, and users feedback so everyone on the same page for the potential block size solution. One of the key strategies in the proposal aims to offset the looming drop in miner rewards by increasing the transaction volume and thus increasing revenue for Bitcoin miners from fees. Published on GitHub by Oliver Jansen, the proposal explained. We believe on the chain scaling is crucial for the long-term health of Bitcoin. On-chain scaling maximizes transaction volume, whose fees are needed to replace minor rewards on the medium to long-term scale. This is expected to be achieved by implementing on-chain scaling and solutions, uh, realizing continuous uh, block syncing, which will not longer require blocks to be synced within a second. The team hopes to do this by transmitting new block data within the full 10-minute interval between blocks instead of immediately after the new block is discovered. 
This will enable the Bitcoin network to scale to significant new levels without endangering decentralization, the team explained. The three-phase approach. Phase one of the roadmap will cover the first and second quarter of 2016, which obviously didn't happen, with the urgent short-term solution of bumping the block size up to 2 megabytes. This will require a Bitcoin hard fork based on the Bitcoin implementation of 0.112 and 0.220 with 75% activation threshold of 750 of 1,000 blocks with a 28-day activation grace period. So when these core wallets were to come out, this was supposed to be baked into the code. Uh, phase 2. We'll span the second and third quarter of the year. We'll focus on limiting the need for sending blocks within seconds to reduce the effect of block prop- propagation times, i.e. lost minor income from open blocks. The improvements to the PVP layer are also in the works to optimize bandwidth distribution and reduce the workload on constraining Bitcoin nodes. I think we're going to eventually, yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to have to talk about nodes and decentralization. Man, this, when I first initially started out, I thought, you know, seven episodes top. But as we continue to, because this is one of the reasons why I avoided this for so long, really, just, you know, a deep, deep understanding of the block size debate and just, you know, stuck to the surface. This means it's a very complicated um, subject matter. So here we go. The phase will attempt to de-emphasize increasing the block size as a solution with a greater consideration of potential on-chain transactions um, through put gains by implementing several new changes to the code that will finalize after further deliberation is included. So here's some bullet points. Uh, parallel validation of blocks theoretically reduces the profitability of excessive block size block attacks. Uh, header first mining largely nullifies excessive size block attacks. Thin blocks, uh, blocks refers to transactions that have been well propagated rather than this allows miners to pre-announce the block that they're working on to minimize the data set once a block is found. Validate once. Transactions have been validated when entering a node's mem- memory pool do not de- need to be revalidated when including the block speeds up block validation. And then phase three or quarter three and quarter four will focus on making the block size limit more dynamic through only after miners and Bitcoin companies are content with the block size increase from previous phase. This will be carried out using a variation of BitPayCO's Stefan Pairs proposal where the validation cost of the block must be less than a small multiple of the average cost over the last difficulty adjustment period. In addition, the team plans to implement a simplified version of the segregated wisdom solution from Core after its release. So they want to raise the block size before segregated witness comes out onto the scene. Uh, finally, the Bitcoin Classic team has announced that they will soon hold an on-chain scaling conference with no specific date as of yet to discuss the proposal, including this roadmap with the Bitcoin community. That happened. This wasn't one of the proposals that was discussed. Uh, meanwhile, uh, blockchain CEO, well, it was, but it wasn't pushed out into the community too well. Uh, meanwhile, blockchain CEO Peter Smith tweeted his recent experience running Bitcoin Classic, a bit known as this is a low-key trial in an effort to support scaling the network and solving the congestion problem. After a, a week plus of running Bitcoin Classic, it performed just as good slash better than our uh, Bitcoin J Core and BTCD nodes. So the Bitcoin Classic guys, they they came out with the roadmap. They came out, you know, with their solution and they presented it to miners, the Bitcoin community, um, big co- Bitcoin companies, and it just it just didn't take off. It wasn't initial. Like a lot of people looked at it and were going for it, and it just it just never stuck. It really didn't. And even now, almost a, a year after it was launched, um, is not even considered really in the the game, if you will, as as far as the solution to address the the block size. Now, this comes directly from the Bitcoin Classic dot com, and it has to deal with the block size, their their viewpoint, if you will. In Bitcoin Classic, the block size is no longer limited by rules set by the software developers. It's set by you, the person running the software. Uh, the article explains how this works. Picking the per- perfect block size in Bitcoin transactions are gathered in blocks, which is structured in a chain. The reason we use a chain is because of the main innovation of Bitcoin, which combines it with proof of work to have a global consensus about the transactions that are accepted. The size of this block has never been relevant to the process, and we can either see that our over the lifetime of Bitcoin, that the size of the block has grown basically solely on the requirements of the network. Miners have always been the ones to decide on the block size, and they've always done this in a coordinated fashion. This is a natural con- consequence of rather elegant, economic design of Bitcoin. Uh, here's the 4.1. Miners earn more fee-based income when they produce bigger blocks. 2. Miners take more risk of their blocks being orphaned with bigger blocks. 3. Miners want to avoid emptying the memory pool with every block as they lose the total need for users to pay fees. And 4. Miners want to make sure the mean pool does not become backlogged because users that do not see the transactions confirmed will get disappointed and find other means to do payment. 
which hurts the price and effect hurts the miner's income. So far, it hasn't quite hurt the price or the miners, but we may reach a point where that will be the case. The genius of this balance has the natural consequence that the blocks will not be made too big or too small. The size will be based on the amount of pain users in the state of technology. To get the most profit out of the system, the miners will have to find a market equilibrium for the block size. This market equilibrium also, has to, also happens to be the best for owners and merchants of Bitcoin. So what does Classic do? Bitcoin Classic removed the one megabyte Megabyte essentially planned maximum block size limits from his software and gives tools to his miners and users to protect themselves from malicious actors at the same time. We call that the accept limit. Classic will accept blocks produced by other current implementations in the node software, including core, unlimited, etc. Blocks produced by Classic will be accepted by all other softwares, including core, if less than one megabyte, and by unlimited and others, but not by core if the blocks created are one megabyte or larger. Classic will put the user selector default default block size limit in the Coinbase message in the form of an EB37, uh, where the number is the amount of megabytes per block this node accepts. So when you run in a node, you can kind of get to choose that. And they configured the code where you can accept um, the Bitcoin Unlimited solution or even the Bitcoin Core Classic solution. Um, and they try to make it so that they're not really conflicting with anybody, particularly Core, because Core is 80% of the nodes majority of the hashing power um, for them not to be considered validated or kicked off. How do I configure this on my classic node? The main change is that Bitcoin classic nodes can now be configured manually to have any block size limit. So they can allow it for any block size to come through their, their node. So you don't have to really update or do anything um, messy, if you will. First, there's a new talks about configuration. Okay, way forward. Classic has been in conversation with miners and other Bitcoin co companies for some time, and the way forward to breaking the one megabyte limit is clearly one where we move the control over the block size out of the hands of software developers and make it a market set property. This is the most healthy solution going forward. However, this is going to be done in an ongoing conversation. It's very optimistic to know that people are in fact talking about how to solve this in the general agreement that is needed solving. Classic is there to make suggestions only and not to dictate policy or make decisions on which solution to pick. Some things are for certain a block size increase will happen, and the planning and details will be made very public when they have been decided. Either way, Classic will be part of the movement. So they made some adjustments since um, coming out onto the scene, if you will. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were considered the solution. So they're willing to work with other codes or concepts with the Bitcoin Unlimited and core being discussed here. But in particular, their you know their emphasis is on raising the block size. They want to make it to two megabytes. And the second thing is to this is something that has been kind of bantered around because some people feel that the miners, while they do play an important role, you know, securing the network, uh, because of centralized mining, they have too, maybe too much sway onto the network that they, they may be in fact be holding the network kind of in a sense hostage, if you will. This is an accusation that's been bantered around. And so there, there are people considering changing this aspect of it to where it becomes, um, I wouldn't say decentralized, but or even more fair, but it's not solely just based upon the miners, where the users have just about as much say or have a say as the miners do. The other thing is that this is seeking to kind of take away the control of the Bitcoin core has over the network with the protocol. And the updates, I mean, they're the only ones who really can configure the, the protocol in and of itself. And now it comes back into more of the hands of the users. So you're not so heavily reliant, I guess you can say, on core developers, where some people feel that they are also an obstacle in progression of the Bitcoin network. Now, one of the critiques, and we'll, we'll talk about it when we talk after discussing all these different solutions, the negatives, is that... This proposal does, in fact, change the nature of Bitcoin in the sense that, the, you know, the miners don't have quite as much say as previously before. And some of that say goes to the users. So there's an issue about network security. In particular, in general, miners have been, even with all the different solutions that have been proposed, have not been exactly very enthusiastic with raising the block size. Now there have been some that have come around. Um, some have been supporting Bitcoin Unlimited and how Bitcoin Core does support the same protocol or solution that Bitcoin Unlimited does. And we'll talk about that. Even Bitcoin XT and 
big Bitcoin XT is going to be actually um, the next episode. I'm going to move it to a different episode because there's the things uh, is a Mike Hearn project and there's things that went on with that. I think that's very important because Mike Hearn, you know, like Gavin Andreessen, left Bitcoin core. He left the development of Bitcoin and we'll get into that when we talk about him. So there's some people that don't like that. In general, there's others who don't like the fact that it's a hard fork. You can also, you can also have a split in the chain. Mind you, this was even before the Dow incident where we saw that happen in real time. Uh, there's also a concern that, you know, you're not going to get consensus. You're not going to get enough people to go for it. Not everyone is um, for the raising of the block size. And maybe we should try something different, which is segregated witness, which is can be done without a soft fork and doesn't necessarily have to, you know, raise the block size if you will. And we'll get into that when we talk about both versions of the segregated witness. So I'm going to read um, BIP 109 here. So BIP 109 is created by Gavin Andreessen, and it's the basis for the um, Bitcoin Classic. Uh, it's a layer consensus hard fork. It's a 2 million byte size limit with a SIGOP and a SIG hash limits. Uh, the status was rejected. It was created January 28th, 2016. And here's the abstract. It's a one-time increase in the total amount of transaction data permitted in a block from 1 megabyte to 2 megabytes. Uh, limit on signature operation and hashing. Motivations. 1. Continue current economic policy. 2. Exercise hard fork network upgrade. And 3. Uh, mitigate potential CPU exhaustion attack. And then it goes um, in the technical aspects of it. Uh, I'm going to read just a couple different things. Um, activation. 75% of the hashing power support triggers, followed by a 28-day grace period. Solo miners or mining pool operators express their support for this BIP by setting the fourth highest bit in the block 32-bit version. The first block with a bit set, a time set less than or equal to the expiration time, and at least with 750 or out of 1,000 blocks preceding it, with the bit set shall define the beginning of a grace period. Blocks with time sets greater than or equal to trigger the block stance time set plus 28 days shall be subject to the new limits. So once you put forth this sequence or input this, um, then it triggers that if it, they reach a 75% hashing power. As always, miners are expected to use their best judgment on what is the best for the entire Bitcoin ecosystem when making decisions about what the consensus level changes to support. So should it remain like a 95% for consensus or should we have it at 75%? And then it has an expiration date. If this BIP is not tr triggered before January 1st, 2018, uh, GMT time, it should be considered withdrawn. Miners that support this BIP should be set the BIT in it so you can activate the ex expiration, expiration date. After that date, the BIT could be safely reused for future consensus rule upgrades. So after that, then you can re-input it if you want, but there, there's an expiration date. And given that we're in 2017, it was created in 2016, and there's supposed to be an August 1st segwit uh, times two. Um, activation is supposed to happen. I very much doubt that Bitcoin Classics could be implemented, but it's something that could be done as, at a later point in time, if you will. And then it states it's backward compatible, meaning that you don't have to rechange everything that all the stuff that happened before um, is still valid. So that is the bit bone nine. This is the basis upon which um, classic um, is utilized. Uh, there are other bips that it works with and we'll get into that when we can talk about Bitcoin XT and eventually Bitcoin Unlimited because Bitcoin Unlimited does um, have some bips that it uh, rules if you will that it is following. But in general, this is like the second kind of proposal when it comes. Bitcoin XT came before this. But this one came. Um, a lot of people did support it at first. You know, he had the Gavin Andreessen name attached to it, Jeff Garzik. And it just it never gained traction. The miners never went for it. Yeah, you know, you had the Hong Kong agreement that happened in February. Nothing really came of that proposals at all. And it just, it never had the, the traction that was needed. And maybe it was... Uh, not fully explained to people. Maybe everyone just didn't really like the 75% hashing power. Perhaps if it stuck with the 95%, uh, instead of changing the consensus rule there, maybe it would have got, gained traction. But as of right now, while there are still nodes out there and there is a mining pool that supports a Bitcoin Classic, in general, I would consider this solution somewhat dead. Now, the notion from one megabyte to two megabyte, 
is not dead, but this particular solution or proposal to address the block size is. So that is it for this episode. Um, you know, this that's what Bitcoin Classic is. That's, those are the people behind it. It's Gavin Andreessen, Jeff Garzik, uh, Jeff Tuman, And these are the people behind it. We talked about who the miners are. Uh, some businesses were for it. You know, eventually people did change their minds. It was proposed very early on, January 2016. It came at a time when, you know, Mike Hearn left, Gavin Andreessen left, the Bitcoin core development. They came up with these type of solutions. And then you kind of got the, the fracturing or the real serious split within the community when it came to regards to thank you for listening please rate and review either through itunes or stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show thank you and until next time this has been a ferocious shine space on network production